All right, everyone, we are finally ready after some tech issues. It's our first one. Give us some patience. Uh, one each month over the next three months, and uh, we hope that we can facilitate and engage uh, Laporte uh, in topics that matter locally. Uh, I don't know about you, but I sometimes get kind of bogged down or intimidated when I think about federal solutions to local problems. Uh, but when we localize issues and we talk about what's happening in our streets and in our neighborhoods, uh, I feel like we can uh, do a better job of finding better solutions here uh, in our streets. And so uh, we are going to have three different topics this summer. And the first one today is going to be child advocacy. We're also going to have a month where we talk about addictions, as addictions have impacted our streets as well. And we'll also uh, ha have another one um, about mental health. And so we hope that you come to those as well. Please invite your friends, your family. They don't have to come to State Street again. We uh, here are a just and generous uh, expression of the Christian faith, but we want to just facilitate these conversations because we believe it's important. So... Um, I'm going to introduce our, our panel in just a second. You are going to be able to ask questions. Now, you'll see here um, that you can text the number to ask questions. Um, but you also, if you have the app downloaded, you can go to uh, open your app. And at the bottom of the app, you'll see discussion over dinner. And you can go there and submit questions through there as well. Um, you'll also find bios for all of the people that are on our panel today and ways to contact them afterwards. After the night's over, I encourage you to uh, seek them out here um, afterwards and you can maybe ask them how you can uh, get involved in what they do or you can ask um, how uh, you can be a help in the community or if there's any questions you don't feel comfortable asking in a group setting, you can obviously ask them there. And I think, I know Karen did, but uh, they might have some other information for you as well um, to do. So to get, so I do want to encourage you to, we have lots of food and drinks and desserts and things like that. Don't be afraid to get up and go get that stuff. Just because we've started our panel doesn't mean you can't get up and go um, to, to do that. This is an informal gathering. Uh, we will be podcasting this uh, video wise, but also we'll be starting a monthly podcast as well, an audio podcast that we'll put out each month um, as this continues to grow. So if you are listening on our podcast or watching on our stream, uh, we welcome you as well. So uh, we will get started again. Feel free to ask questions if you have them. Uh, feel free to um, uh, text them in and we will uh, continue to have a dialogue about child advocacy in LaPorte County. So uh, I will introduce our panel and I'll invite them to come up here and we will start the conversation. So the first one I'm going to ask is Chris Albert. Come on up here. Chris Albert is the principal at Riley Elementary. Yeah, go ahead, Chris. Um, then Esther Stiles. Um, Esther, what is your title at Doombrook? Because it's really, really long, and I try to memorize it. What is I'm it? I'm the program director of Community Partners in Nurturing Parenting. Did you guys get that? Yeah, it's really impressive. Go ahead and come up here, Esther. Uh, Karen uh, Bernacki as well. Uh, she is the CEO and the founder, actually, of Family Advocates here in Laporte. So welcome, Karen. So guys, this will be the mic that you'll need to, just because we need to get you recorded and everything um, through the live stream. So share this with each other um, and uh, as you respond to questions. And uh, I'll start real quick about a little bit of stories about how I know you guys and why I invited you. Um, so Chris here is uh, the principal at Riley Elementary, and he's also my children's principal. And um, so he can give you lots of stories about how to uh, live with louses. Um, <laughs> but uh, I've gotten to know Chris fairly well over the last year or two through different uh, programs that uh, my kids have done, but also through some other things. Uh, there's uh, a program or an initiative that the school has started called, that the Fort School Systems has started called Guiding All Kids. And uh, it's a very kind of a reworking some guidance counseling type of uh, programs, but also I feel anyway, 
it's reworking almost educational philosophy of the schools. Very excited to be a part of it. It's a four-year process um, that was funded by the Eli Lilly Foundation, I believe. Yes. Yeah. And uh, actually, Chris, I'll let you uh, say real quick, um, if you want to give him the mic. Uh, we just got a, a very uh, cool email last week about uh, a certification for the school. So why don't you announce that before it goes public here? Right. Part of the uh, Guiding All Kids initiative that Nate was talking about uh, is you're trying to get gold star status and essentially what we're trying to do is improve the social emotional and academic programming that we offer in the schools and oftentimes uh, Laporte High School already has gold star status and ramp which is the national certification which we have to apply by <coughs> September to go for ramp which is the next step uh, but we were just announced that uh, Riley Elementary got gold star status which is really important um, Thank you, thank you. And I, I think it kind of piggybacks on what Nate is trying to talk about in the schools, what we're trying to do for child advocacy is get input from the community. You know, what are you guys looking for out of the schools? What can make it better for your child? Uh, and that's really what we did. It kind of started a conversation and uh, we're really excited. We brought in a lot of people from the community. So it's not, you know, sometimes when you work within your own profession, you can kind of get in a fishbowl. Mm -hmm. I'm an educator. I was trained as an educator. I think like an educator. If we bring people who are not in education, then you know they bring a different perspective. And I think that's a, essentially what we're trying to do. Uh, and it was really, it was really successful. It's hard, you know. We kind of tiptoe over and say, "Hey, Nate, what are you doing for four years?" Uh, so that can be kind of a tough sell for some people. But this was the most intense year. Uh, but we still have three more years to go, which is good because we're kind of tackling things one at a time to make the programming and the paradigm shifts that are necessary uh, for the 21st century student. They are, it is a different experience than when we were in school. Uh, real quick, while you have the mic, Chris. Uh, Riley is a very unique school, demographically and everything. How would you describe Riley, like uh, Riley Elementary, to people to understand? Because you've got ethnic diversity, you've got economic diversity. Uh, how would you describe your school so people can understand it a little bit? I, I think that's a perfect way to say it. Um, you know, we may not have the racial diversity that, that in some schools around the state will have, but socioeconomically, uh, we're very, very diverse. Um, we have single parent homes, we have multi-generational homes. Uh, it's, it's basically just about anything that you can think of. Uh, to be blunt, we have rich, we have poor, we have everything in the middle. Uh, so it's kind of a unique perspective. Uh, when we are offering things, we want to make sure that it's open to everybody. So we have these types of conversations all the time. So it's not just, well, we're going to do this fundraiser. And if kid, if, you know, parents give this much money, they can go and this much they can't. We can't do those things. We shouldn't do those things. So we come up with a lot of creative ways uh, to do like all school field trips and things like that. We have a, a marvelous PTA uh, that, you know, we, we get a lot of money through our walkathon and some other things like that. We're constantly trying to push the envelope to improve the experiences that the kids have. And our, our parents have been wonderful, and we're real excited about that. And, you know, it, it's fun to see everybody come together because, you know, you, you try to say that we're colorblind kind of idea, but we really, you know, the philosophy at Riley is, is, you know, kind of the old three musketeers, you know, one for all and all for one. We really want to make sure that we're giving the experience to everyone. All right. Thanks, Chris. Uh, Karen. Uh, Karen is uh, a friend as well, but uh, Karen asked me to be on the board of Family Advocates uh, about two years ago. So uh, I'll let you know that I, I am a little biased here. I do serve on the board of Family Advocates, and I'm, I'm proud to do so. Um, but uh, Karen uh, and I uh, built a friendship, but also we, we, she has allowed me into seeing some work that I did not know exists. Uh, I didn't know some of the stories that, uh, that, that are happening in our community are, are happening. And, and real quick, Karen, before I get you to describe a little bit about what Family Advocates does, I'll, I'll, I'll say, in order to be a board member at Family Advocates, uh, one of the requirements, or maybe the encouragements anyway, is that you need to attend court um, and see what our kids who are in the court system have to go through so that we can advocate better for it as a board and understand what they're going through instead of just you know, be making decisions for things we don't understand. And uh, I went to court one day with Karen and, 
and uh, saw stories there. And there was a, a little boy there, and uh, there was uh, he had an advocate with him. I think he was living, if I remember right, Karen, he was living in a group home. Uh, he was a, a maybe 13, 14, uh, living in a group home in Indy, but he had to come to Laporte for court because he's originally from Laporte. Um, but uh, the advocate that was with him was essentially his lifeline to hope. And I saw that, and the kid had very few people in his life that even knew his birthday, that knew that he mattered, that, that actually would speak to him in, in ways that would bring hope and encouragement to him. He had a really, really rough, rough life of neglect and abuse. Um, but it was in that moment, Karen, that it solidified in me that this is crucial work in a community. So I want to invite you to say a little bit about what Family Advocates does and kind of what you guys are doing in the community. Well, and I think what you're saying is so true about what we do because it really is about the stories. And when um, I think about it, I think about... I think it was September of 1990, and I became a court-appointed special advocate, and I had my first young man. He was 12 years old. And I went to him, and I tried to talk to him. And he came from a home where his mother um, was schizophrenic, his father was in prison, and all of his siblings had been split, and they were in other foster homes. And... It felt like an awesome responsibility to try to connect with this young man because I'd known he had gone through a lot of trauma. And he would not look at me. He would, as I talked, he looked down. He would not look at me. I finally told him, I said, you know, I'm not, I don't, I don't get paid to do this, but I really care about you. I'm just a volunteer. And when I said that, he looked up and he smiled. And that's when I knew that it wasn't like the paid people that were going to change the li these kids' lives. It was all of us who take some time and just do it because we care. So that was a long time ago, <laughs> and I'm still here. <laughs> and I've had lots of kids that have um, come into my life. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background, um, Family Advocates did start with the LaPorte County CASA program. And for those of you who don't know exactly what that is, um, I didn't make it up. It started in 1977 um, in Seattle, Washington, by a judge who was feeling just as frustrated, I think, as everyone about what was in the best interest of these kids who were in foster care. And they decided that maybe we could just train people and they could get to know a kid and they could report back to court about really what was in the child's best interest, about what their needs were, who were the people that were important to them, um, and, and it works. And kids who have one person who follows them throughout the system have a much better outcome than those kids who don't have that significant adult in their life. And, I'm, and that's just, there's research that backs that up. But I think we all know that in our heart, that, that, that kids all need that one person. Um, so that's what was kind of started Family Advocates back in the day. And then in 1999, um, we decided, you know, we looked about, and parents were visiting their kids in settings where they were, you know, in McDonald's or in somebody's office, and our volunteers who were supposed to write reports and to the court and make recommendations would come to me and say, uh, how do I know if this child can parent when they're at McDonald's or in an office? That's not parenting. You know, those of us who raise kids know that there's so much more to that. Um, so the 1005 Michigan Avenue, where we still are today, was vacant. Um, so we collaborated with Swanson Center to create Harmony House. Uh, which is our supervised visitation program. And the neat thing about that is that, for me especially, because I have all these kids running around the house, but um, they get to make a meal, clean up, watch your kids, play outside, bathe your infant, all those things that you do as a parent. And we're there to teach them and model with them so that they can learn so that when they get their kids back, and that is our goal, then they will have those skills um, to be a better parent. 
Um, and then in, it's been a while, let's see, uh, 2013, we started the Court Appointed Youth Advocate Program. Um, and this has been a really um, interesting experience um, because it was something brand new. But we thought that kids who are involved in delinquency court. So a lot of the status offenders, the kids who don't show up to school, the kids who continually run away, the kids who get in fights all the time at school. Um, I noticed that when they came to court, sometimes they didn't even have a parent show up with them. The other times they might have a grandparent or a great grandparent. Um, so we knew that they were just kind of floundering and, and didn't have really that supervision and support. So we started the Court Appointed Youth Advocate Program, which is for those kids, for kids who are 13. We try to pick, we do like 13 um, to 16 or 17. Um, and the neat thing about this program is, because if you're a teenager and someone said, and you, you know, you're in court, you got arrested for runaway or something else, and someone said, oh, you know what, would you like to have a volunteer? We know that teens aren't going to go like, why would I want that, right? So we made it so it's part of their probation. So now they have to cooperate with this person. And what happens is that they build this relationship, because it is all about relationships. And when they're done with probation, they kind of have that relationship similar to what Nate was talking about with that young man in the residential placement is that they voluntarily now sign to keep that person in their life. And we have found that all of those kids haven't reoffended. And some That's of them, amazing. yes, amazing. it is amazing. And they've gone on to get um, jobs. We have one in the National Guard. We have one who's a manager at a McDonald's. You know, things that I know that those kids would not be able to do. We had a young woman on Wednesday night talking about how important it was to have this person who just kind of checked up on her all the time and gave her hope um, for some kind of future. And and that's, I think, is what, I mean, all of you are here today is, or tonight, is about doing that, that we know that we all have to be involved, we all have to do it together, and we really can do something, I think. Thank you, Karen. And uh, to, to, yeah, go ahead. And I'll, I'll brag a little bit about Kaya, because um, Karen went out and presented with a, one of our uh, other staff members at Family Advocates out in San Diego, and... Um, and about this program, because this is our program. We've designed this program in Laporte and everything, um, and got great feedback. And so uh, we are in the process now of, of uh, copywriting this program, and she's been invited to go to other communities now um, to present it so that this program can grow, not just in Laporte, but all around the country. So um, the staff at Family Advocates, again, uh, works very long hours, works a lot to make things like this happen, but it, it, we see these kind of programs that do have a uh, lasting impact. Um, Esther Stiles is a, another friend of mine. Uh, I actually met Esther, uh, I don't know if I met you through Doombrook or through the hum Human Rights Commission, because it all kind of blends together a little bit. Human Rights Commission. Um, but Esther and I were on the Human Rights Commission here in Laporte, and uh, Esther was the president of the Human Rights Commission, so. El Presidente uh, is what you can refer to her as. Um, <laughs> but um, es Esther's heart is uh, bigger than this room, though you want, might wonder how that happens. Uh, she cares about justice issues. She cares about equality. She cares about kids and that all kids know uh, that they matter and that all kids feel safe. Um, and so, Doombrook, so whereas um, family advocates in our community deals a little bit more with child abuse and child neglect intervention, Doombrook kind of tries to do a little bit more preven preventative work so that new parents or, or parents who are growing up in other, uh, in other environments might have the skills necessary to know what uh, nurturing looks like and how to do that. So. Uh, Esther, why don't you tell your story a little bit and how you got here, so. 
Thanks for getting me on the crying binge before we even get going. Mm -hmm. I'm a super mush, mush ball, so I apologize ahead of time if I get emotional later. Um, so Dubrook um, started in 1989, I believe, um, as Child Advocacy Center, um, really in the, the beginning of the whole Child Advocacy Center movement across the United States um, here in LaPorte County, which is really, really cool. Um, and the, the concept behind a child advocacy center is to have uh, one place when a report is made to law enforcement or um, Department of Child Service agencies, um, one place for them to meet with the family, meet with the child to find out what happened. Um, a lot of child advocacy centers across the uh, United States have um, counseling services available at the child advocacy center. Um, many of them also have medical services available, so if a child needs an exam, that they can do that right there. So that uh, the idea being that the, the child and the family aren't having to go multiple places and talk to multiple people. Everybody comes to the table in one place. Um, so that was really kind of the heart of Doombrook when it started. And then um, from there, uh, well, I'll add too that we um, acquired the property as a result of restitution from someone who had been convicted of child molest and was spending pretty much the rest of his life in prison. Um, and so part of his restitution, I believe he had a couple of different properties and he sort of um, made any one of them available um, to, uh, uh, for this uh, Child Advocacy Center um, program. And so if you come to visit, you'll see as you're walking uh, through the agency that a lot of the artwork and things that we have on the wall, the frames are from the original house that was there. Um, throughout the, the years after it got going, there were a number of agencies in the community, businesses, um, construction companies and whatnot, just a lot of volunteers from the community who really helped um, build it into the agency that it is today. Um, so we have the, the Child Advocacy Center, um, and then we have some of our parenting programs, like Nate was talking about, um, Healthy Families um, works with uh, new parents while they're prenatal, or um, they can enroll in the program up to uh, the infant being three months old. Um, and then uh, once they enroll in the program, they can be in the program up uh, until the time that child is three. And our home visitors come in and work with them on um, again, just really basic parenting skills, um, understanding child development, um, connecting the families with other resources in the community. So um, if there's, you know, maybe a concern that the child's not developing the way that, um, that maybe they could be, then, you know, we'll make sure that they're referred for services to do assessments or, or what have you, um, as well as connecting them with um, housing or uh, utility needs, anything like that, referring them for counseling if the family's struggling and, and wanting some therapy. Um, so those families can be in the program until the child is three, and then they, we have a big kind of graduation ceremony for the kids, which they love. And then um, <clears throat> uh, from there, the kids are able to maybe enroll in Head Start and, and continue the education piece for them. Um, I am the director of our Community Partners Program. Um, we are a DCS-funded um, program, uh, and I believe Community Partners, I want to say DCS created or, or um, got this program going back around 2006, um, again with the idea being um, prevention. What are some things that we can do in the community um, when families are uh, referred to DCS, but maybe there's not anything going on that DCS needs to substantiate. So again, it could just be families that are struggling and need resources, but there's no reason for DCS to maintain any kind of open case with them. They refer them to, to community partners. Um, we work with them anywhere from three to six months, um, depending on the family's needs. Again, really just working on connecting them with other resources in the community if they need, um, as well as um, just parent support and education in the home, helping families develop uh, structure, um, a schedule for the kids, working on nutrition. Um, Purdue Northwest um, has worked with us on some nutrition programs and, um, gosh, what else do we do? Just parent support groups, um, uh, classes that parents can come to just, again, to, you know, um, work with other parents, learn from other parents, as well as just learn how to develop 
um, things like empathy or nurturing, like you were saying. Um, so just really working on strengthening the family unit um, and connecting them with resources so that ideally they can um, just build on their own strengths as a family and not necessarily need intervention then from other agencies and especially uh, DCS anywhere down the road. Awesome. Thank you so much, uh, Esther, as well. Um, and let's get into some questions. Again, feel free to text if you have any questions. Go through your app and you can do it as well. Um, so I, I actually have a question uh, for Karen first. Um, so we see some development in Laporte. Laporte is changing as a community. Alice Chalmers obviously isn't here anymore. We've got uh, you know some some different visions and stuff like this for where we've been and where we're going. Um, you've been doing this since the '90s. Uh, you know, for only being 35, I don't know how that math works out. But um, <laughs> but um, you've been doing this for a while. What what it, what do you see now that's different than what you? seen maybe 5, 10, 15 years ago? I mean, what are you seeing that, that, that has changed? Well, I think um, we have a different level of... ...services, I think, and avenues for people. Um, when I first started, they had... Uh, um, well, they still have TANF, but more people had access to public Say, assistance. What, what is TANF? TANF, uh, what is it? Temporary assistance. For, thank you. Hey, so, they, so, they, so when I first started in the 90s, it was easier for people to get assistance. And over the years, that's kind of lessened. Um, but obviously, we have the, the issues with drug addiction. Well, from always, we had people who had issues with drugs. We had, but we had cocaine and crack cocaine. That was like the 90s. It was kind of the, um, and when people went for treatment. Oh, yeah, I like how you said it. Like the 90s. I think those of us working in the field kind of think like that. Well, remember when it was just cocaine and, we, you know? <laughs> yeah, I don't I remember. And, you know, we didn't even marijuana. I don't, yeah. didn't even have marijuana. Oh, we dream of those days. <laughs> we yeah. dream of those days. But in the, in the thing with that was you could send someone to treatment, and it was a very short-term kind of treatment. And we all know that heroin is a whole different kind of drug and opioid addiction. Addiction is a different kind of drug. So, you know, in the 90s and even in the early 2000s, we would get cases where kids were running around, um, not lack of supervision, um, a messy house. They might be um, mostly those kinds of things. There would be some physical abuse. Um, and even, actually, we had more sexual abuse cases um, than we do now. But now when we get a case... Real quick, Karen, what, what, what changed there? Just better education, better better prevention, kind of things, or either that, or we just don't know about them. Okay. Yeah. I mean, I'm, yeah. I'm I hate to say that, but no, I yeah, think absolutely. I think though I think in that situation, and we we talk about it, is that we're getting these cases and and for a different reason. Okay. So once kids go into foster care, we may find out that there are some other things going on. Um, so when we when we say a dirty house now. It's full of, it could be full of animals, it could have ceilings falling down, they could have feces all over, and garbage. It's nothing, you know, and I, I thought there was a police officer. Yes, I'm sure he, <laughs> I, he's nodding. So I'm sure that he's gone in and seen the same kind of things. It's, it's, it's much more of an extreme. We have kids who, you know, we find next to their parent with needles in their arms. You know, the, the things that kids go through now by the time we get them out of the home have caused so much trauma that I'm sure that Chris sees it, the, those kids in the school system. You know, I mean, it's, it, it's not just here we can, you know, we'll take you out of foster care, give you parenting skills, and, and you know, fix it. It takes, year, it takes a year, years really, to fix these families. So. Yeah, that, that's, um, you know, and, and like you said, uh, um, many of these issues are impacted by other issues, right? Because 
many of these are rentals, many of these, you know, and so if we can fix some of our rental and housing issues, uh, you know, it bleeds into some of these other problems uh, too, so. This is just, this is no, no research, this is just my feeling. I think it has to do with hope. Mm. I think that we have to, there's a reason, you know, now we still have people with heroin addictions, right? We have been talking about this and we still, people are still using. So they've, they're still starting it. It, it. We need to get back to why is it that you don't have hope? How can we give you hope that that isn't your escape? Sure, sure, good, good stuff. Um, Chris, let, let, me, let me ask you a question real quick because you're, you're involved with the education aspect. You, you guys spend more time with our kids than most of us do because our kids you know, are sleeping when I spend time with mine. Um, <laughs> but um, you've been a principal for what, two or three years now? This is four years four at Riley years. and okay. six at the high school as an assistant principal. Okay, and you were a teacher in South Bend Public Schools, right? Yes, I was. <laughs> two, two years there. And, and then, then before that, you were where? Five years in San Antonio and uh, six years in Michigan City. Okay. The witness protection program has been very good to me. <laughs> <laughs> I, uh, yeah, so, I, but I think that, that it's helped me kind of see different experiences, different, different parts of the country. I actually student taught in England, too, so I've had a lot of different experiences in 23 years. Yeah, that, that's fantastic. And you're, you're getting your doctorate right now as well. Um, but... Um, have you seen similar changes in what your kids in the elementary schools are going through? Are you seeing, like Karen said, because sometimes we only look at numbers, right? Well, there's 500 kids or there's 200 kids that are going through this, and we only are concerned with how the numbers fluctuate, and we don't often look at, but let's look at the stories of those numbers, because if you know, if Karen is, is right here, the amount of trauma those kids are going through is actually increased. Are you seeing similar things in the schools? Absolutely. And, you know, the, the educational side of things, when you're going through your pedagogy classes and they say, okay, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. If you're hungry, if you don't have clothes, if you don't have shelter, you're not going to learn. If you're cold, let's just turn this temperature down to like 50 degrees and have this panel. Everybody's just going to be mm -hmm. shivering and they're looking for a coat. They're not concentrating on what's being said. So the trauma that these kids are coming into school with, you have to have the relationships. You talked about mentoring. Mentoring is huge now. Um, Robin McShane, our counselor at Riley, uh, started the Rocket Buddies uh, last year because we have the Youth Service Bureau, and they're wonderful, but they only have a finite amount of adults that can come in the building and establish these relationships. So we actually have taken on kids with the staff members to try and provide you know, that, that sort of bond with the student to, to ask about them, take an interest in them. Uh, and, and that's what we try to do every day. Uh, that advocacy gets spread out in a, in a variety of ways. But if a kid knows that you have an interest in them, they're, they're going to show up to school more often. They're going to open up about their situation. And oftentimes they just need a little help. They need a little support. We've got kids that are growing up way too fast. They see things that they should not see. Um, and you know we need to be there to, you, we can't always fix every home. But while that kid is at school, we try to make it a safe haven for them. And that's really where our focus becomes, is, is try and develop that positive relationship with them, making positive contact with every kid. We've got 420 kids at Riley. And then I say, oh, well, that's easy. It's not easy to do that every day, to see every kid, say their name, smile. How's it going? If you know, hey, they play soccer, ask them about soccer. You know, uh, whatever connection you have with them, you try to make that connection, and it does make an extreme impact on the lives of these children. And we try to do that every day, but it, it, it's difficult. And, you know, knowing some of the things that they, they bring into school, and, and you've mentioned the stories we've already heard just during this panel, we, we see that on a daily basis. You know, the reality is, is we do have to call Child Protective Services. Uh, do we do it every day? No, but once a week uh, absolutely if not more than that so those types of things you know we do have to do that to advocate for that child uh and and to 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 kind of go with that a little bit more one of the things that i i was really surprised this year to, to kind of discover a little bit um a really impressed with your staff you've got a great staff uh i met many of them this year um and 
but you, you have tests. You have standardized things you've got to get. Um, building relationships takes time, right? Um, building kind of uh, taking an interest in kids and learning stories and, hey, you know, what's happening in your life? That, 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 that oftentimes comes into conflict with, okay, but we also have these math things, these core requirements that we have to do. And another thing, um, and if you could talk about this a little bit, um, you know, as participation in, let's say, sports or Cub Scouts or Girl Scouts or churches, um, places like that, they, they, they diminish a little bit. The, the, the attendance on those places are, aren't as high anymore. Those are oftentimes the uh, places that kids learn virtue or, you know, learned uh, how to, you know, these other kind of types of education. Now, that's on you guys, right? So how are you guys trying to meet those needs as well? And how, you only have so many hours a day. How do you balance the needs for, you know, ones, twos, threes, ABCs, and also let's make sure we're educating the whole self as well? Right. Well, there are challenges. If anybody's seen the curriculum, basically everything got pushed up. If you're used to seeing kindergarten per curriculum, that's preschool. First grade is kindergarten. Second grade is first grade. Everything just, you know, so it's gotten pushed down where developmentally some of these kids just aren't ready. Uh, so we're seeing that too. And if we get the educational side, we have to talk about the differentiation of where are these kids coming in with their academic level. Uh, so there are curricular concerns, and we certainly have those challenges. But as I indicated earlier, if they don't have the emotional support, if they don't have that bond with you. Kids can smell right away if, the, if you like them or not. You can say, I love you. Okay. Are you, you know. telling me my kids don't believe me when I, when I yell that to them so after if I you, tell them to go to their room? I tell you what, you get, you get a group of second graders in there and, and they'll tell you right away if the substitute teacher liked them. Mm -hmm. if the teacher likes them, if they, you know, they can smell that out right away. So it's our challenge to make sure that we're listening to those concerns and find that balance to providing help but still meeting the academic uh, you know, curricular needs that we have to meet. Um, but we also have programs in place. You know, Robin's done a great job about like one program we have, is, if you're not aware, is like banana splits. You don't have to be a child of divorce, but we have a lot of you know, well, there's a boyfriend. Now there's a new boyfriend, and mom's with the third boyfriend. And, you know, we just kind of, you know, come on. You can, you can join this group, and they, they, we need parental permission. But we have programs like that in place where we'll set aside time throughout the week to meet, and we can talk about your individual needs, but it doesn't pull them out of the classroom nonstop because we got to make sure that we're still meeting their academic needs, uh, which are great. Um, you know, and, and so many of those things. We, we make a lot of phone calls to parents. How can we help? What can we do? Um, and there's a lot of programs. I think LaPorte is doing a lot of things out there. Uh, Lisa Piersikowski is out there. Lisa does a lot in the community. There's a lot of things that the kids, that, that we can do for them. Third grade is the big I read test. We were talking about that at our table at dinner. Uh, so this, you know, two years ago, uh, the LaPorte County Library came up with a program for all the second graders to take home books in the summer, it's called Rise. And it allows them to have a book bag and they have books and they take them home and they read them and then they bring them back in August. And you know, having that access to literacy is very important because I'm sure many of you showed up today, you'll pick up the kids, you'll take them to the library, get books once a week or more. We've got kids in this community that do not have that access. Mm -hmm. They don't get to the library. Mom or dad won't take them. Or, you know, I remember a kid that, that I had in Michigan City in an alternative school. Uh, we used to be in the building uh, now where Swanson Center's at. We walk across the street to Cool Spring Branch Library. This kid can't check out a book. I'm like, why not? Well, because six years ago, he didn't bring Charlotte's Web back. And now he owes $609 <laughs> for a $14 book that I'm handing him money. Like, I'll pay for the book. Well, no, no. So he can't check out a book. And it's like, so this is four or five years this kid has not had access to, you know. And, and, I, and since then, I think the library has recognized those pro programs and problems and said, okay, we're going to do Library 360. We're going to have some other programs. We won't charge the late fees. So I think we've tried to react to those things. But these are real concerns we have in the community that, you know, yeah, book fines and all that are fine, but we got to get, the kids yeah. have to have a book in their hand. You know, we can't get caught up in our, our policies when there's a, there's a need for literacy. So I think in all those things, you need to find a balance. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and Esther, I, I, 
good questions coming in, by the way, and we're going to get to these real quick. But Esther, one of the things that we worked on at the school this year is we, 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 we talked to kids about the things that they're worried about or that they're thinking about or that they want to improve. And one of the things that we were really kind of surprised to see amongst our, our younger kids even is they'll articulate how anxious they are, like tests and things like this, how, how that they're, they're, they feel pressure that I don't remember feeling many years ago. Do you see that with what you're working on and do you see that? And what do you think, that, what do you think that's coming from? Um, I, I do think that we see that not just with the kids but with their parents mm -hmm. um, because I think that, you know, throughout the years, and I, I, I can't say that it comes from any one particular source, but um, an example of what I'm thinking is how, you know, when our kids are rambunctious and we tell them, just go relax. But that's all we say, and what does that really mean? Are we teaching them how to relax? Are we teaching them literal skills of, you know, sitting down, deep breathing, anything like that? So as you get older and you don't really know those skills, you can't teach what you don't know. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think uh, we see a lot of those things gener generationally, um, whether it's um, anxiety, depression, just a lack of, uh, you know, anger management skills, coping in general. So if, if again, parents don't really know how to do those things, then they don't know how to teach their kids. And, the, and there's this assumption, I think, sometimes th from parents that our kids just know how to do things mm -hmm. um, without being taught. Um, so that's part of what we really work on with them when we're in the homes is helping them understand developmentally what their kids are able to do at their age, what's appropriate for them to do or not do at their age, um, working with parents on um, their own self-care and, and self-empowerment and um, building their skills while also teaching them how to teach their kids to build their skills. Absolutely. Um, and I, I think just to, to piggyback on some of what both Karen and Chris talked about, um, you know, I graduated from Laporte High School, uh, left uh, a semester after to go out east for college. Um, so I was in Philadelphia for, um, gosh, probably about 13, 14 years, uh, Richmond, Virginia after that. So I was gone for 20 years, came back. And one of the things that I noticed when I came back was um, – it's kind of what a depressed community Laporte was. Um, and a lot of what I heard um, from, from kids and from adults was just sort of this expectation, a, a lack of ambition. So when you talk about hope, you know, and just uh, needing to find a way that we can really foster hope. Um, like hope wasn't the default position of anybody that you talked to, kind of? Right, right, right. And just sort of this expectation of living in, um, in poverty and living in the situations that they were in. Like, this is just how it is. Mm -hmm. And so their kids are, you know, know this is just how it's going to be. Mm -hmm. So when I get older and I um, – have to go to jail or when I get older and I'm on food stamps or and and hear me when I say I'm not at all knocking those things are really important yep. pieces and support for our families but the the lack of hope and ambition behind that that there's nothing there's no other option it, it's like it's like determinism right it is what my parents went through um, and it is what I will be as well and I, I right. would say probably Lisa sees a lot of this as well as the Center Township trustee and we do it at the PAC Center as mm -hmm. well. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, and so I think that tied with, you know, some of uh, what Chris was talking about in terms of really getting to know the kids in the school and knowing them by name and helping just that relationship building and how important belonging is mm -hmm. um, for all of us, you know. And, and I think the way that our society has developed over the years with you know, you, you graduate and you move away and maybe you come home and maybe you don't. You know, I was never coming back after I graduated. And 20 years later, I could not wait. Um, but there's, you know, we, we've kind of developed as a way of isolating ourselves, not just uh, from communities that we grew up in, but even within our community. We are, you know, not as much neighboring, to mm -hmm. use your word. 
um, and family connection, there's so much isolation that I think um, our adults struggle to feel a sense of belonging, much less our kids. And so I think, you know, any of the things that we can do to really help um, connect kids with each other, connect kids with adults, help them see, gosh, we really do believe in you. And there is so much more. There is hope outside of your situation. This doesn't have to be the end all. Yeah, I, I think, again, we say here uh, that, you know, three of the most powerful words you can give people are, you're not alone, you know, um, because they feel like uh, poverty or abuse or neglect uh, ostracizes the, the individual. It robs you of your hum humanity to where you feel like you're alone. And when you go through life alone, then all kinds of terrible things happen. So um, let's get into some questions here that have we've got lots of them that have been asked. Um, so I'll, I'll, I'll ask you this one, Esther. Is there a list of services available to struggling parents that teachers, educators, uh, might be able to hand out during parent-teacher conferences or at school open houses? That's a great question. Mm -hmm. um, I would say, uh, you know, one of the things that Doombrook has been working with, um, uh, the United Way, um, there is online 211, which is an online resource, so it's exactly what you're talking about. It's easily accessible online. Um, you can print anything from there um, if you look up specific keywords. So if there's a specific issue that parents are, are um, needing some resources on, um, one of the things that we do is just help provide resources. So they don't necessarily have to um, enroll in, in our services long term. They can just call to say, you know, I, I need help with paying my rent this month or I I need help with housing or whatever, and we will just provide resources in general. But I, I would absolutely direct anybody to um, 211. It's a, it's a great online resource. And if there are agencies or businesses that you know of who provide those kinds of services or are willing to make donations or what have you, encourage them to make sure that they're on 211 so that when folks like you know our agency is looking for mm -hmm. resources that we can connect families with your business. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, Karen, this one's for you. Do you feel advocate services are mostly court-initiated than voluntarily partic voluntary participation? Well, I know there's a lot of mentoring programs in the community that are voluntary. Mm -hmm. um, I think that for some people, sometimes you need to have that carrot hanging in front of them that gets them involved in the service. And that's usually by court. That's why I think drug court works so well for people is because they, par they might start out participating because they're ordered to, but then really kind of get the benefit from the services that they're offered. Yeah. Does that answer that question? Um, I think so, yeah. Okay. Um, I also want to add, you can call 2 on one You don't have to go online, just. Oh yeah, that's a good yes. point, yep. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, Chris, one, Chris, this one's for you. Um, are these organizations able to work together to help identify issues with children to help with prevention? Specifically, can a school contact organizations when there are concerns? So can you go to these other organizations do you have the freedom to do that on behalf of the child, or does the parent have to be involved as well? So well, how do you handle that? You, you got to imagine that, you know, we don't want to circumvent the parents. Um, but to answer your question, yes, we have an open door, and we certainly try to use as many agencies as we can to provide the help. You hear a call to CPS and everybody cringes, but sometimes that can be a very good thing for a family. They need help. They, you know... They, they need services, so you can do that, but certainly we don't like call Johnny into the back room and get an agency on the phone and strike that up. We wanna make sure that the parents are aware. If, if personally speaking, only for myself, if I feel like a family is struggling or parents need help, I'm gonna go directly to the parent and I'm going to tell them that because that's part of my responsibility to advocate for that child that I see a problem. Um, and that's a difficult thing to do. It's easy to sit up here and say, yeah, I do that. But it's, it's hard to do that. Uh, sometimes people disagree with me. We'll have divorced parents and one parent agrees with me and the other parent doesn't. 
So where do you go with that? Joint custody. I don't want that. I do want that. You know, we run into problems like that. But yeah, we do have accessibility, and I think that we have had nothing but success when we have reached out for help. I can't give you an example where somebody slammed the door in my face and said, we, we can't help you. Um, but certainly we know the reality. When I first started as an administrator in 2008, we had a lot more agencies than we do now. The agencies have fallen by the wayside. Uh, I used to give out pamphlets, and there was a lot more names on that pamphlet. Now there's a lot less names. Uh, and we, you know, I know mental health services is another topic for another month, but, you know, those types of things are still very necessary. But we do feel that, you know, there, there definitely are a lot of services out there we can reach out to. And I know, for, for instance, Sarah Fine, our attendance officer, will utilize those services, talk with a family and say, do you need assistance with? And, you know, we'll pick up the phone, we'll make those calls. I've, Lisa, how many times have we talked this year? Three, four, five, six times? I mean, if we, if we have to, we utilize it. And sometimes we'll get information that we didn't have on our end to help us help the child. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, uh, this is a, a great question. Um, and there's two parts of this, and we'll get to the second or the first part later. Um, how do you guys do what you do, hearing the stories that you, you hear, entering into this work of you know, justice and advocacy on behalf of those who are most vulnerable in our, com our community and not get your heart broke over and over and over again? How, how, do, you guys, how do you guys go about that? Well, see, uh, for me personally, I flip it around. What a great and awesome responsibility you have to be able to help mm -hmm. in that situation. And yes, there are certainly heartbreaking situations, but we have an opportunity where we can make a difference and help that child. Uh, so I, I look at it more with that. And, you know, sometimes you swing and miss. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you, you, you try everything you can. And another thing we haven't mentioned a lot is, you, you know, you talked about rents due. In Laporte, we have a lot of people that will switch buildings. So we have to communicate because they'll move from Riley to Lincoln to Heilman to Hanley to Indian Trail. And we're, we're trying to connect the dots. Where's the family now? And we'll call each other. Did you have this one? Yes, I did. So I, I look at it as a tremendous responsibility and an opportunity to help. Uh, but, yeah, certainly there, there are some nights when you're, you know, it's tough. It's time to get on the elliptical and, and work that off because it's, it's hard. And, what about you, Karen? I mean, because sometimes you're, you know, especially not so much now anymore, but when you were in court often, you know, um, hearing these stories or, or just hearing the, um, the struggles that these kids will go through, how, how, do you not, how, how do you not live with the burden of that every night? That's a, those are questions that our volunteers, it's a, <laughs> he's going to answer for me. Anybody <laughs> else is going to answer. <laughs> Um, a glass of wine. <laughs> that, that, does, it is, that does work. But um, volunteers always ask that same question. You know, how am I going to be able to do this? Will, you know, you know, will I feel too much? Will I want to take them home? And I, and I always am honest with them and saying, yes, you will. And you will. And, and, I, and I think that we have to understand that in being in this field that to me if you don't have a heart you shouldn't be here mm -hmm. but you do have to use the people around you to as support our staff they support each other but i always also tell the volunteers when they get sworn in and they bring their families that the people sitting next to you are going to be your support because there might be a, a day they're going to come home and it's going to be it's going to be a bad day that they've heard something you know, somebody committed suicide or, you know, some, we, you know, we have, we've had kids who actually have cancer who are dying and they don't have a parent. They only have a volunteer. Those are hard things. And so we all have to be the support for one another. But at the end of the day, there's, it's, you feel so good about what you do that it makes up for all of that. Yeah. Um, n n nothing great happens without working hard and sacrificing something. And so, like you said, transformation in a kid's life isn't, isn't free. 
it's not gonna it's gonna cost you something but it will be worth it right and you we know? do all hang and hang on to those those happy ending stories as you say you know I mean yet there are those those great stories that you know that we know wouldn't have been great if we wouldn't have been there it's funny you say that because I you know <laughs> I, I sometimes shockingly get some negative emails and letters um, <laughs> And, but I don't save those, uh, but I do have a drawer where the good ones are in, you know, where you, you made this impact. And the other day I was reading one because I, I kind of just needed it. Yeah, you know I mean, I needed, the, I needed the story again to remember that the bad email wasn't, that didn't tell the full story, you know? Um, and so, like you said, you, you, you kind of have to keep that in mind. Esther, do you have anything to add, add to that? Um, well, my first response in my head when you asked that question was, I, I don't know, because I have my heart broken all the time. Um, and then for me, that's where, again, the hope and the belonging come in, mm -hmm. in terms of, you know, knowing that I'm, I'm working hard and that I am working with an amazing group of people in the community who are also working hard to make things better for every child in the community, for every family in the community. Um, you know, I'm, I work hard at connecting with my family and friends just to relax and have fun outside of work stuff. You know, the self-care piece is really, sure. really important. It's not always easy and sometimes yep. gets pushed to the wayside as, as all of us can, can say. But um, I, you know, those heartbreaks do lead me to places of okay, so what's not being done? You know, like you said, the mental health services and, and other agencies where things are, are dwindling, how do we build those back up? Um, and maybe not through a specific agency, but what ways can you guys here at State Street or through the PAC Center connect with, you know, someone else? What are ways that we can get the community to fill those gaps where before we always turn to an agency sure. or pro paid providers to do that. Um, and so that's where some of the, the hope comes in for me. Um, you know, just a, a one little thing that I was sharing with Karen at the table is um, <clears throat> one of my passions is, is making sure there are services in the community for our, our LGBTQ community. Mm -hmm. um, we really don't have much of that. Um, although over the last couple of years, there have been a, a dozen or so of us who have worked really hard at um, finding resources um, either within the community or outside and bringing them in so that we have some kind of support and information for our youth and for our families in LaPorte County who identify somewhere on the LGBTQ spectrum. So um, seeing where the gaps are and finding ways to fill that gap. And I think, it, it, and you can clarify if, if this is wrong, but I think the number one demographic of suicide are LGBTQ teenagers, correct? It is very, very high. Yeah, yes. I think five With times higher With transgender being yep. at the highest piece yeah, of that. Yeah, because, yeah. again, when you don't have a sense of belonging, when you're told over and over again that you're not okay because of who you are at your core, what hope do you have? Uh, um, that, that word belonging is a, a very, I think, important word, especially as a church. A church has an opportunity, I believe, to be a place of belonging, and we, we, we really hope hope to create that culture. And that's why the PAC Center meals are so important to us right. and things like that, because um, it's not about just feeding you. It's about, uh, we talk about the poverty of loneliness, because it is. It's a poverty when you're lonely. Uh, Chris, this is a question for you. Um, what effect has technology had, good or bad, on uh, our kids? Well, it's affected the concentration level. I mean, you know, I can't compete with PlayStation 4. I'm not that entertaining. So, um, but I will tell you, when I was in the classroom as a teacher, I could get my students to buy into what I was selling and making that connection. And, and I think that's still extremely important. Nothing replaces the teacher in a classroom. Technology is a secondary piece. It's an ancillary that we use. Certainly kids would love it if we just said Chromebook day, iPad day, and they didn't talk to a soul. They would love that. I mean, they, so it's a very powerful force, but we also have to understand the power of what we're doing right now, engaging, communicating, uh, is, is very important. So I think we have to be very careful to embrace the technology. We use it. How many people remember card catalog? Come on, right? I mean, that's, 
you know, who Remember got the encyclopedia. What? What yeah, right. See, Nate doesn't. Everybody else does, right? <laughs> but like, you know, we grew up in that. You want to learn something? I had to go in the garage, and we had 26 volumes of the Webster International Encyclopedia. And I'm like, alphabet, oh, that's P-I, no, okay. P -I. Oh, there it is. And then I'm flipping through the book. Now we Google it, yeah. right? Thank I used, God. I used to know everybody's phone number Sounds when I was exhausting. a kid. I knew everyone's phone number. I don't know my mom's phone number sometimes. Like, wait, because my mom and my sister have listening. those. I know. Don't listen, mom. But, like, I, I think that, you know, the technology in some cases can make you a little bit dependent, a little bit lazy, uh, certainly takes away some of your focus. But that doesn't mean that we want to be anti-technology. We want to embrace it. Uh, I just think that we have uh, to be responsible in how we're introducing that and also make sure that, you know, there's a specific, you know, learning measure that we're trying to use technology with and not replacing conversation. You know, texting is doing nothing for our spelling or our phonics. <laughs> You know, and I and I'll and we you laugh, talk about true though, in right? the 90s. You talk about one thing as an educator. What what have I seen differently from 1995 in year one to today? Spelling. Mm -hmm. Oh, spelling's atrocious now. But like, if I want to text you, please, it's P L Z. <laughs> no, that's not how you spell please. So I think that that sometimes we can get in real bad habits with that. But we also have to embrace and understand the the power of technology. Um, because it is powerful for our kids. So we just, like anything else, we find a balance. If you're a parent out there, I've got a 13-year-old. My son would be more than happy if I just said, iPad summer, I'll see you in August. He would, he would be thrilled. He would love to just stay on that thing. But, you know, as, as parents and community members, as, as educators, we have a responsibility to make sure we, we find that appropriate balance. And in, in schools, we have Chromebooks, we have iPads, uh, we have programs uh, that allow them 45 minutes a week, the kids get on iReady, and it's tailored to their mathematical ability. That is extremely important. You ever sat in a class and the teacher's up here and you're like, I'm not looking at anybody, I'm not saying a word because I don't understand anything you're talking about. Well, what this program allows them to do is get on the computer and it talks to them at their exact level and it keeps challenging them incrementally. That's important rather than having them sit in front of a class when everybody else is multiplying and you're barely adding. Mm -hmm. So we have programs like that that utilize the technology, and that's 45 minutes a week that's just to their level. So mm -hmm. things like that are extremely important, and that's probably not something that you know, people know about. Yeah, that, that's great. Um, this is a, a, a question, I guess, for either of you, um, perhaps. I, uh, I'll try to word this in a way that is... Does it scare me? Yeah. No, <laughs> it's, it's a great question, actually. Uh, but so do you find that most of the cases of neglect um, or abuse, does it have something to do with drugs? Um, what about, um, the question here is, what about kids that need more one-on-one, -on -one, like uh, more direction on work to teach them and stuff like that? Do you find, do you find, let's do the first piece first. Do you find that um, drugs has something to do with most kids who are in the system right now? It does. I would say 85% of our cases are drug related, but I think that we need to step back and say it's probably a lot of mental health issues. A lot of it's self-medicating. -medic um, not access to mental health services, those kinds of things. So I don't like to say that that's the reason. Um, it's probably more of mental health issues. Mm -hmm. Mental health, and that just bleeds into just, a lot of the drug. Okay. We, we find out about it because now they have addiction issues. Yep. Um, Esther, this one's for you. Um, how do you teach a child that he or she is worthy and valuable? Um, you know, I, I, for me, it's, it comes with listening. Um, a, as a parent, I have a 16-year-old Great name, son. by the way. What's your son's name? Nate. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Go figure. Um, 
So, so for me, uh, as a single mom raising my kiddo, it it just came down to learning how to listen to him a lot and not always uh, pretend like I knew what I was doing. <laughs> um, and um, uh, part of my philosophy was just raising him with dignity and respect, wanting to treat him the same way that I would treat you as an adult. Obviously, I didn't give him adult responsibilities or share things with him that weren't developmentally appropriate, but I didn't, um, I didn't make him less than mm -hmm. either because he was a child. Um, but having said that, I think, you know, for me, part of it was just being willing to say I'm sorry when I knew that I messed up and use that as a teaching opportunity. And so just a lot of communication, talking, and I, you know, to... I think that's where we come back then to some of the technology um, issues and, and we get so caught up with being on our phone and the false sense of connection that sure. social media can give us, um, you know, and there's great pieces about it. I'm able to keep in touch with my nieces who live over in Virginia and my other nieces and nephews who are down south, which is great. Um, but. <clears throat> but I have to remember to put it away and, and just be at home with my son when he's there, be present and mm -hmm. remind him to put it away so that we can hang out with each other. Um, and so I think sometimes we get so caught up in, that, in the technology and connecting with other people because maybe we feel anxious about what's going on at home or we feel a little disconnected about what's going on at home. Um, and so then that disconnect just grows. And mm -hmm. I think sometimes that's where uh, some of the neglect comes in because you're just not, uh, you're just not able to access some of the internal resources that you need to, to be a parent. Um, whether it's patience or whether it's just listening or whether it's talking and communicating or um, you know, uh, understanding that everybody gets angry. So again, you know, when my son was mad, I just let him be mad and we'll talk about it when you're done instead of uh, he's not allowed to be mad. Mm -hmm. um, so understanding that he has the same feelings I have and, you know, he's just being four. So mm -hmm. I'm the one who needs a time out, not him, <laughs> because he's not, you know, I, I'm the one who's stressed and irritated and I want things to happen right now. And he's, you know, just doing his thing. So I'm the one who has a problem right now, not him. Oh, that's good. I need yep. time out. I need to regroup for a second and then, you know, get him on board. <laughs> yeah, that's good. I, I feel like everyone needs to read like a Brené Brown book or something about their own vulnerabilities and, you know, mm -hmm. about, you know, how to deal with, it's okay to admit, even as a parent, I don't know, right? Mm -hmm. You know, and to invite your kids into that and I messed up here, I, you know, or we're figuring this out together, you know. Um, right, I, and then where do you go from there? Helping yep. them learn how to develop, you know, critical thinking skills and problem solving skills so that you don't just stay stuck in that I don't know place, but let's acknowledge that. And then what can we do? What are some, you know, brainstorm a little bit or reach out to other people who, who might be able to help you step outside of that box that you're kind of stuck in. Thank you. Yeah, we just got a couple more minutes. This went really quickly and there's still a ton more questions. So I do encourage you, if your question didn't get asked or if you have another question, um, talk, talk to these guys after. In your app is their contact information. You can contact them through the app as well. Um, so if, if we don't get to your question, I do apologize. Uh, but so many really, really great questions, and I wish we had uh, more time. Um, I, I, whoever wants to answer this one is, is welcome to, but it's kind of a, a little bit of a long question. But how, um, how do people who kind of, you know, they love their kids. They want the best for their kids. Um, how how can they partner well with um, organizations and, and environments? Okay, that maybe have a high amount of trauma kids in there because they believe that having you know how, how does that look like for kids that. Is it better to put your kids in there who aren't going through a lot of trauma with kids who do as a source of kind of, um, not inspiration per se, but as a source of just hope, you know what I mean? 
Um, or is it wise as a parent to essentially, you know, protect your kids from those who, like you said, Chris, know too much at their young age? What, what do you think about that? Anybody? <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, that's an educational yeah, that's that question, was a, but, but I know that my kids have always been around the, you know, when I had Casa kids, I think that kids should be around all kinds of kids to learn that empathy and understanding. Um, and I will say that my kids as adults are very nice people. They're very, you know, they're very tolerant. And because we opened ourselves up to anyone, um, and maybe different in an educational system, I don't know, but I'll let you. Yeah, Chris, do you have a, an opinion on that? Well, right? I think that, you know. Especially with school of choice now, right? A lot of, right. Well, for those of you that don't know, if you live outside of Laporte and you want to come to Laporte schools, that's called open enrollment. If you live within Laporte, you live on this street, but you want to go to a different school, that's district exception. So um, the money stays in Laporte regardless of where that child goes to school. But there is an element of you have to sell yourself and, you know, you want people to know that you care and you're doing what you need to. So a lot of these initial referrals uh, programs like this actually initiate in the schools. And I, I think the way I would answer that question is uh, you have to listen to the parents and, and make sure that they understand if they've got three kids and one of them's troubled and the other two aren't, it's probably important for all of them to go. Because the one who's silent in the corner that'll be fine probably isn't going to be fine. You need to address that with them and make sure that they get the, the same attention that the other two are getting. And, you know, so I, I think things like that, that, you know, you need to listen to the needs of the parent, uh, but also encourage them. Look, you know, here's a number. This is a, an agency you can call, but make sure that you're, you're taking the time to talk to each of them individually and you know, use your parental instincts. If you think that they need help, they probably do. Bring them to the session. Don't just bring the one child. And, mm -hmm. and, and I think a lot of the parents in Laporte, you know, will seek out the help. I, I think they, they do. It's sometimes the follow-up. Unfortunately, and, and not to speak negatively, it's just the reality, a lot of turnover in those positions. So they get, they get uh, kind of accustomed to a certain case manager and they like this person and three months later they're gone. And now they've got a new one and they didn't click with this one as well. And, and you know, or people will call and sometimes, you, you know, because there's such a need for it, you know, you're calling today and you get in October 1st. Well, people don't want to wait that long. So I think when, you know, when we can provide those services as quickly as possible, uh, that's always going to help them. And, you know, for the most part, we need to make sure that everybody's getting the help in that family and not just one or two. And that's how we look at it. Okay, just um, we'll do one more question, then we'll wrap up. Um, how do you teach families to hope when services are disappearing, support services are having work requirements imposed, wages are low, health care is unaffordable, rent is up, when higher education has started to mean a lifetime of student debt, do you teach them to hope for something better, or do you start teaching them to cope and manage with what they have? I would just, again, I always look through the lens of an educator, but when we have uh, systemic poverty or we're dealing with issues like that, oh, what a powerful country we live in where you can change your life. I mean, in one generation, you can reach that apex for yourself and, and make those changes. So, you know, we try to make sure we promote that, that we're, okay, mom and dad, don't have a high school diploma. That doesn't mean you can't, or nobody in my family's ever been to college. We get a lot of that. Well, that doesn't mean you can't go to college. So that's how we try to build it up that, you know, one step at a time. And I think as parents, don't we always want our children to exceed what you accomplished? I, I hope Chase blows me out of the water in every category there is. That would be... My kids already have. So. Yeah. <laughs> I can attest to that. No. Um, <laughs> but... <laughs> Don't laugh. <laughs> I think this is going to get edited. That got cut out. But I, I do think that, you know, we have in, in this country an opportunity there where you have to provide support and, and make sure that, you know, they understand that this cycle can end uh, and you're a major part of that. And we will be here, 
you know, every step of the way. And I, and I think that a lot of times people do recognize that, that the teachers care very much, as Nate said, and it's true. I have a wonderful staff, and it's not just one person. I, we, we have a wonderful staff, 55 people in the building uh, that all are working together to help a child. And, and I think that that's one step that we can do is make sure that you know that, that we care and you can make a difference in your own life and your own future. Um, anybody else have anything to add to that? Or? I just think on, on my perspective and working with the families that we work with, it's really teaching to respect yourself. You know, when we have a sign at Harmony House, so when someone comes in to do a supervised visit, it says everyone that walks through the door will be treated with respect and integrity. And we, and we don't, once you go through that door, we don't care what you did that got you there but we're going to be there to listen to you and support you and try to help you. Most of these people have been beaten down for so long that they're not used to that. And so I think that as we respect and listen and encourage, even though they're in those situations, they will start to take our advice a little to help them connect to other ways of getting out and feel like, they can do that, and, and it takes a while, but uh, it can happen. I would just piggyback off what Karen was saying. Um, you know, my thought when you asked the question was, was both of those things that, you know, I would start with this, what strengths the family already has, you know, helping everybody in that family unit identify, like, what do you do well, and what do I do well? What do I appreciate about what you do, and how can we build on that? as well as, you know, what, what other options are there, things that you can do? Because, r right, typically people hear all the time, you can't, you can't, you can't. And so then I internalize, I can't, I can't, I can't, I can't do that. I can't, you know, run a program. I can't, you know, have a home by myself with my kid. You know, all those things when, and just helping them see, but you, but you are doing that. You already are doing that. It might feel stressful. It might be frustrating. Maybe it's not where you want to be. Where do you want to be? And how can we get some baby steps so that you, you see that you are already working toward? You know, the fact that you're reaching out or we're having this conversation is already a step forward. Yeah, and I, if I'm hearing you right, and I, I think I am, um, the work of advocacy is saying, you know, okay, you're here, but you don't have to stay here and we're going to help you get here, you know. So in light of all the things we don't have, we at least have each other, and we're going to go there, you know. And so, and I think you guys do a great job with and that. And that you're the expert. Mm -hmm. I'm not. You, you're the expert in your family. I'm just here to help you move forward. Yep. I don't know what you need, and I'm not going to pretend to know what you need. You tell me, and I'm going to help you get there. Sure, absolutely. Um, and while I'm with this one, um, what brings you hope? This, honestly, um, you know, just the the conversations about how can we think outside the box and how can we connect with each other in a way that's different from how we have been. Um, uh, my son brings me help. He's a smart, funny, you know, like you said, he's he's far beyond where I was at his age, and that excites me to no end. Um, and and working with truly great people in the community that I, I deem, you know, movers and shakers who are making things happen that a lot of times we say we can't, but we are. Karen, what brings you hope? Well, of course, my family. I mean, I think that's always first. I mean, those are my people. So, you know, it's my support. Um, and really, I think it's all of you who are here on a Friday night to listen to us and to ask questions because I've always felt and, and um, I've told people in Indianapolis that come to Laporte County because we really are doing things well. We do want to make change and we are pretty close knit kind of group of people who work well together. I and mean, we have a school system here, you know, represented. And there's a lot of communities that just doesn't happen. And so I think really hope starts here. Mm -hmm. Chris, what about you? What brings you hope? Those are great answers. Um, I, I, you know, I believe in the power of education. 
I, I believe in the power of the teacher uh, and, and the direction and, and the love and support that they provide. Um, I believe in the parents in my school. Um, so I, I think there's a lot of there's a lot to be hopeful and, and optimistic about. I just think that, you know, as Esther stated earlier, you have to listen. Don't don't pretend you're an expert, um, but let them know that you're extending a hand. And I think that the you know, it's, it's got to be reciprocal. I think that's the one thing for me that, you know, you can't um, you can't assume that, you know, I mean, in 23 years, sometimes I wonder, have I learned anything? Because, you know, you'll make mistakes along the way, and you're like, I should know better than that. But, you know, I think if your heart's in the right place and you, cons and you consistently try to help as much as possible, that, that provides hope uh, for others. And, and I think there's a, there's a big component in Laporte that pays it forward. I have seen that a lot, and I think that that's, that brings me hope. Is, is that, you know, like you mentioned, you know, Karen, there's a lot of people here on a Friday night. There's, there's a lot more interesting people you can listen to than me. Um, amen. Amen, right? <laughs> but I think that, that, you know, we're all in this room because we care. We care about the kids in Laporte and in the surrounding community. And, you know, I think that the message to those families is that there is help out there. Um, and all you have to do is ask. And as we go out of here and, and as we continue down this path, uh, one of the things that we do this, why are we, we're doing this, is we, we here at Stage Street, we're a just and generous expression of the Christian faith. And we want to be um, arbiters of hope in the community. So uh, when we have people here um, like you guys, we want to know how can we partner with you. So if somebody's in here and they want to help you, Chris or Karen or Esther, how can we partner with you? Well, there's a good plug for the Guiding All Kids. Um, this, this first year we did a lot of meetings. Next year I think we only have three evening meetings. But if anybody would ever want to come to Riley Elementary and get a hold of me through school email, um, let me app. know. And, yeah, it's in the app. Uh, and let me know. It's just it's a conversation uh, similar to this uh, in a classroom. There's about 25 to 30 of us. We're just trying to help kids. So if you would like to take it a step further, um, this is going to branch out to the other seven elementary schools. We just were the first one. Our Lily Grant was $617,000, so um, we got decent snacks. Um, but uh, so if you would like to come out Name and brand tribute. snacks even. Yes, yes. Um, because in all seriousness, we've, we've had a lot of good ideas, and I think that's really good for educators to hear from the community and, and find out ways that we could do better to help kids. So I, I think that we would welcome you. You are welcome anytime uh, to the building. Just knock on the door. We'll come on in, and, and uh, you can see the good work that we do every day with your kids. I mean, there's some security things too, but whatever. Um, <laughs> Karen, how, how can we partner with you? Um, well, obviously, I need volunteers for both programs, for CASA and CAIA. We have 135 kids who don't have a CASA volunteer. So, you know, we know how important that is. And especially when I know our volunteers will come to me and they'll, we'll, we'll be leaving court and they'll look at me and they'll go like, what if I wasn't here? And that's what we think about when we think of those 135 kids that don't have a voice. Um, the other thing that I would ask you to do is just reach out to your neighbors um, and try to be a listening ear to them as well. You know, I, people always expect me to tell everyone to call CPS and, and, you know, report abuse, which you should. But before that, if you can reach out to your neighbor, um, it might have a more positive effect and make change in their life. Oh, with CASA, real quick, um, if somebody wanted to be a CASA, because I, I feel like um, that's, that's an intimidating thing, uh, <laughs> in, in that I think it's very, people don't understand what the commitment is. Sure. If you, somebody did want to be a CASA, what does that look like? It, they come to you it, and they... And I do have some, I have some stuff out in the, in the lobby out there too, so please take some, a bunch of stuff with you. Um, to volunteer, we do, we have to do about 25 hours of training, but we do it in about a week. So we do like three evenings and an all-day Saturday. Um, 
other than that, we just want somebody who cares about kids. We teach you the, you know, we, we have you observe court like Nate did, so you have an idea of what that's about. We have a lot of staff that support you. You're basically going out and getting to know a kid and, and, and finding out what their situation is. They're already placed outside of the home, so we know they're safe, but we need to know what's going on with their life, and then you make recommendations to the court uh, what's in their best interest. The difference with our program than any other volunteer program is that you're, um, by the Indiana statute, are a party. So you're like, you have the same, you have the same power as an attorney would. So we, it's a pretty um, heavy kind of load in a way in that, but you see what's going to happen in this child's life. You will know when you're done with this case where this child is and that they're okay. Um, but please check out our webpage um, and take some stuff out in the hall. And we, and, and we also have the Kaya program trains a little, it's about three evenings. It's a little shorter than So if you than prefer a youth Instead of they're a child. older kids. Yeah. They're, yeah, they're 13 and older, um, and it's and it can be a longer term just because of the mentorship after they're um, off of probation. So that relationship is up to the two of you how long that lasts. Um, for the CASA program, we ask for a commitment of a year, but everything is really done on your time, and we do use we do text our kids because that's the only way they'll talk to us sometimes so we do use that kind of social media and things so but please give us a call if you're interested and just to plug here uh our board member here our leadership team member kelly tenger is a, a casa volunteer as well so if you have other questions about that and you know you think karen's trying to sell you something <laughs> kelly will give you an honest uh an honest answer for those questions as well esther how can we help you um I'll make it a short list uh, for now because I, I have a lot of ambition for what we can do in the future. Um, I, I would definitely um, just mirror what Karen is saying in terms of reaching out to your neighbors, you know, the folks that you're already in community with, um, offering to help spring clean each other's houses or something so that the, the single moms who maybe isn't going to ask can can get that within the group setting mm -hmm. or, you know, offering to babysit so that someone gets a break and, and, you know, helping with food or things like that. Um, in terms of our agency specifically, we do a lot of different events in the community um, when they're back to school events or, you know, health fairs, things like that. Sometimes we're a part of it. So it, it's nice to have extra people at the table just to help um, share information. Um, we bring a lot of books with us. Doombrook is very big on literacy as well. Um, our administrative assistant does an amazing job with grants and getting books. So we, if you see us out in the community, we're giving books. Um, so that kind of help. Um, I, what I envision down, down the line is getting um, parents in the community who are interested and willing to train to do parenting groups just so that we can ripple that out. So it's not just, you know, staff doing that, but mm -hmm. you guys are running a group, a parent support mm -hmm. group here at State Street and, and Bethany's running a parent support group and, you mm -hmm. know, everywhere. Yeah. Well, can you please give them a round of applause? Thank you so much for being here. Thank you all for being here as well. I hope you enjoyed uh, the dinner. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. And uh, we hope to see you again uh, next month. Please invite your friends and your family as we uh, continue these important conversations uh, for LaPorte County. So thank you so much.